If you have your Bibles, I invite you to find your place. Psalm 100. Psalm 100. Many of you know one of my probably biggest pet peeves is going into the store, especially in a time like right now, bypassing the period of time that we are in to get ready to make some money on something that hasn't even got here yet. We haven't even got to Halloween yet, and there's Christmas candy. I mean, whether you like Halloween or not, listen, that period of time, there's some good candy that comes out. And, and why, why rush it to get some candy that's red, green, and white, and all of that? Or now we get to Thanksgiving... And the, the shelves now, because of consumerism, more and more and more, we want to start creating. One thing, if it was all because of Christ, you know in the stores it's all about making money, so let's bypass one to, to hurry up and to get to something else. And that is, that is one of my, my pet peeves. It just irritates the fool out of me when I go to a store and it's already set up. You know, in our household, we don't listen to Christmas music until after Thanksgiving. There are Christmas movies until after Thanksgiving. We can get excited about what we're going to watch, but that doesn't, there is a place and time for that. Especially from that period of time of, of Halloween to Christmas, and, and we have set aside Thanksgiving. Folks, that ought to be a time where all we do is give thanks. We have one day in, in, in November, and we call it Thanksgiving. But I think I, I kind of, I, I thought about this and about changing the title. Instead of just Thanksgiving, for the next few weeks, I want us to look at this thanks and giving. Because listen, when we give thanks, it ought to motivate us to do something. We call it Thanksgiving and it's all about, I hope my turkey is not dry. I hope that pumpkin pie is just the way Grandma made it. Or the pecan pie. I hope those yams are like Aunt Susie made years ago. And isn't that our attitude a lot of times? Is If we stop to think about it, it's what I want, what I like, what I want to have. We go to family and, oh, let's hope that all the dishes I like show up, but if that one dish doesn't show up here, oh, my Thanksgiving is completely ruined. But when we think about this thanks and giving, we're thankful for what? We're thankful for the provisions that God has given. Amen? And in turn, what does that cause us to do? Is it receive or to give? And we know, for the most part, the origin of Thanksgiving, but maybe you don't, haven't heard this part of it. You know, in 1604, King James came to power in England. We know his name is one connected with the King James Bible. And he was relatively tolerant to, to other religion, religious opinions, except those that openly criticized the Church of England. And so secret congregations are, are forming. 
the sinners left their persecuting churches, and there was one such group that was formed not too far from Sherwood Forest in a small village of Nottinghamshire called Scrooby. The authorities found out about them. And they decided to flee to, to Holland and where they had heard they could practice their faith freely. And in 1608, they made it to Amsterdam. And in 1609, they, they migrated in mass to Leiden, Holland. And the majority of this group, led by Pastor John Robinson, was, was still in Leiden in 1620. Joining with a few of the followers, yet in England, they decided to travel to the new world. The group in Holland hired a ship called the Speedwell. Anybody ever heard, hear of that? And another ship was hired in London. Guess what it was called? The Mayflower. And they planned to, to meet up in Southampton, England, sail together to northern Virginia. They met in Southampton on July 22nd. But the speedwell had been leaking on the journey from Holland, so they spent the better part of a week patching her up. They finally set sail on August 5th. But guess what? The speedwell was leaking again, so they stopped in Dartmouth for repairs. And on August 21st, after the speedwell was, you had it patched up again, the two ships set sail for America's. But about 300 miles out to sea, the speedwell began to leak again, and it was determined that the ship was not seaworthy. And the two ships returned to Plymouth, England, where they abandoned the speedwell. The cargo was transferred onto the Mayflower, while several of the frustrated pilgrims, they simply went home. Most of them crammed themselves onto what was now a very crowded ship. Finally, on September 6th, the Mayflower departed Plymouth, England, and headed to America, carrying 102 passengers, including three pregnant women. One baby was born on the voyage. Another young boy died of pneumonia. And on November 9th, they sighted Cape Cod after 66 days at sea. Because of the delays, caused by the leaking speed, while well, many of them had spent the better part of four months on the boat. We're not talking about cruise liners. Arriving much later than expected, they erected hasty shelters. They, they simply were not prepared for the harsh New England winter. And nearly one half of this group died before spring, but persevering in prayer, and aided by friendly Indian, these, these main re remaining reaped a bountiful harvest that next summer. It was these grateful pilgrims that declared a three-day feast in December of 1621. To thank God and to celebrate with their new friends. And this was the first Thanksgiving. And this began the annual tradition in New England and began to spread all over the colonies as well. The first national Thanksgiving Day was November 26, 1789, declared by President George Washington at the recommendation of the Congress. And listen to what he had to say. Whereas it is the duty of all nations to acknowledge the providence of Almighty God, to obey His will, to be grateful for His benefits, and to humbly, and humbly to implore, implore His protection and favor. Now, therefore, I do appoint Thursday, the 26th day of November, 1789, that we may all unite to render unto Him. You know, render is another word to give, right? Our sincere and humble thanks for his kind and care and protection. From that time on, Thanksgiving Day declarations sporadically followed this one until Abraham Lincoln set aside the last Thursday in November for the annual day of Thanksgiving in 1863. And listen to what he said. We often forget 
Anybody have a problem with often forgetting? I was just talking with Miss Diana, talking about a name, and I, I, I still, for the life of me, can't remember the name I was trying to tell. And she said, you know what's going to happen is right in the middle of your sermon, it's going to pop in your head, and you're going to have to say time out in your sermon and text that name to me. But, I, I, I mean, I, I, I deal with that. We often forget the source from which the blessings of fruitful years and healthful skies come. No human wisdom hath devised, nor hath any mortal hand worked out these great things. They are the gracious gifts of the Most High God. He went on to say, I therefore invite my fellow citizens in every part of the United States to observe the last day of uh, last Thursday of November as a day of thanksgiving and praise our beneficent Father who dwelleth in the heavens. This was changed to the fourth Thursday of November by Congressional Resolution in 1841. And since that time, the President officially declares this day every year. Thankfulness to God's provision and giving God what he's owed and worthy of. And what's that? It is our worship, isn't it? When we think of thanksgiving, when we think of giving thanks, when we think of giving to the Lord, it's for his bountiful provision to each and every one of us. We as individuals have many things to be thankful for. In our families, we have many things thankful for. As a church family, we kind of mentioned some last week, but we have many things to be thankful for. Amen? And when we come to a time like this, even though it should be more than just one day out of the year, maybe more than one month in a, in a series of messages, God is worthy of all the thanks that you and I can give. I want us to do something this morning. If you, you, I had you turn, but I want us all to read out loud these, these verses that we're going to be looking at this week and the next couple of weeks. But Psalm 100, the psalmist David, he writes, Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with thanksgiving. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. And it is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him, and to bless his name. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. In a more formal, liturg liturgical church, there was a visitor that showed up one Sunday. You know what this visitor did? He got all excited about what, what the minister, the preacher had said. And you know what he did? He declared, amen, praise the Lord. Someone tapped him on the shoulder and he whis and whispered, um, we don't praise the Lord here. Then another member nearby said, well, yes, we do. It's on page 17 of the lectionary. Some of you may get that. But here in Psalm 100, we're exhorted to proclaim the goodness of God with joy. It's not a, a, a dreary duty, but it's a delightful devotion to the Lord that we worship Him wholeheartedly. That word gladness reflects 
joy in living in harmony with the Creator, Redeemer, and King. And, and here's the thing, folks. Those that have tasted the grace that God has given gladly worships Him. It's not a duty. It's a devotion. It's something that, that we get to do. If our hearts are full of all the thanks that God has given us through the years, even when we think about it today, just this day, from the time we got up to the time we are, got to this moment, is there a lot of things to be thankful for? How many of you were able to put your pants on? Your dresses on? How many of you got up and, whew, Another day, or at least right now, I get to breathe. How many of you were able to get in your car, turn on the car, and it started up? Man. Don't we have a lot of things, many things to be thankful for? And it's in that thought of being thankful that that Echoing that exultant joy in God. That that ought to be our delight. Something that we enjoy to do. I mean, we put, a, we put delight in a lot of things. Let's just be honest, that really don't have any eternal significance. Anybody delight in bluebell ice cream? Uh, go ahead, raise your hand. Yeah, I mean, we're not a litur liturgical church. We can raise our hands. We can say amen. We can say praise the Lord. We don't abide by a lectionary. But how about some bluebell ice cream? Amen? How about a nice, I'm sorry, Brother Don, Nice steak. Amen. With some vegetables. There we go. We, we, we don't want to exclude it. I mean, we, get it. We, we delight in those things. We delight in our spouses. We delight in our, in our children. We delight in the things that we like to do. And then when we delight, what, what causes us to do? We got to go over and beyond, don't we? And guess what? Those things are going to disappear. Guess what? That bluebell ice cream is going to melt. We may delight for a moment, but another time it's going to disappear. It's either going to melt, it's going to disappear in our mouth, and then right here, it's going to start growing. That good old medium steak is going to, you leave it out, guess what? It's eventually going to dry out. Our kids get older. Our spouses may make us irritated once in a while. And then we get over that so that we delight again. But if we truly delight, that pushes to action, doesn't it? We see that all through Scripture about this idea of delighting in the Lord. In, in Psalm 1, verse 1, Blessed is the Lord, the godly, nor standeth in the way of the sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and, his, and in his law doth he Meditate day and night, and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, bringing forth his fruit in this season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The psalmist in Psalm 27, 4, One thing have I desired of the Lord, that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. And to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire 
in his temple. The psalmist in Psalm 37 said this in verse 33, the steps of the good man, good man are ordered by the Lord. He delighteth in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. In Psalm 119 and verse 16, we see, I delight myself in thy statutes. I will not forget thy word. In verse 47 of 119, and I will delight myself in thy commandments, which I love. Do you feel the emotion that the psalmist writes? And giving thanks to God, giving his worship, delighting in, the, in, in his word, in his ways. Let me ask you, does your work, church worship Does your church worship its worship style? Do we as a church worship the worship style? Think about this quote I want to share. Whenever the method of worship becomes more important than the person of worship, we have already prostituted our worship. We don't want to say there are entire congregations who worship praise and praise worship, but who have yet not learned to praise and worship God in Jesus Christ. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. When we look at Psalm 119, one, pardon me, Psalm 100, and we're talking about thanksgiving and it's a call to worship. Why? Because we delight in the Lord. We delight in his ways. We delight in his, his working. And then we look at these first, I want us this morning to look at these first two verses. There are four realities that we see here in these verses. And number one is this, the volume of worship is loud. He says, make a noise unto the Lord. It's something audible. Commentator Marvin Tate described it this way, that the Hebrew word for shout literally means with an expression that can be easily heard. You are to shout for joy to the Lord. He went on to say that the enthusiasm of Israelite worship, not only just here in, in, in one, Psalm 100, but is illustrated throughout Psalm 93 to 100. Shouts are raised as, as they go to the temple. Praises are chanted and sung while, while musical instruments are played. Horns are blown. blown. The, the, the noise of the temple, the, or the worship that, that went on in the temple was legendary. Why? Because of the blessings of God. You know, last week, last Saturday, I'm glad it was last Saturday and not last night, but Brandon and I were able to go to a a soon, oh, you sooner game. I mean, they actually did decent. Then you have to consider who they were playing. But as a fan, it really doesn't matter. When you're really wanting a win, you'll take it. And you know what? We, we sat there and the seats that Brandon got, I mean, they were absolutely amazing. I never experienced it that way. And you're sitting there, and the roar of the crowd just echoed. 
But see, for, for when we were sitting, many people say, you know, I don't like sitting that close. But I tell you what, it was like we were, we were, well, we were sitting four rows from the field. And when the cheers of the crowd took place, those that were at the very top, I mean, you turn around and you're seeing the nosebleed up at the top by the press boxes. And when they were cheering, it was like all that, it wasn't like it was everything rising up. But I was sitting there thinking, and all this cheering felt like it was coming down right on top. It was phenomenal. It was exciting. Listen, you could, you could sit there and not even know anything about football and want to be, take part. I'm just going to cheer to, to be a part of this. But you know what happened? When the, the buzzer went off on the, at the end of the fourth quarter, people left. We sat there because thinking some of the football players would come over. But you know what? They leave the home side and they go over to the visitor side. The band comes over and takes up on the stage if you stay long enough. Or they come up on the farm of the field and they play. But everybody's leaving. And you know what? There's no more cheering going on. Once that game is done, that cheering is gone. But what we read about going up, it, the volume was loud. You see, yeah, there, there are places in Scripture where it says to be still and know that He is God. To, to come into, to, to, with a sense of reverent awe. But there are places like here in Psalm, 91, Psalm 100 where God has his, his hand on the volume knob and he is cranking it up to shout triumphantly, making a joyful noise in what God has done. And one of the realities that we see here is that the volume of worship is to be loud. To be excited about what God has done. We can sit here and we'll say amen that God has given a bunch of blessings, hasn't he? Has God blessed your life? And we'll shake our head. But we, do we crank up the volume to what God has done? But we see another reality, and it's this, that the call of worship is global. Make a joyful noise, all ye lands. God has commanded all his people to worship. Those who have put their trust in Jesus Christ to stand, to, to make their voice heard, singing praises to Jesus. That's the call of worship. Ringing out to the farthest places on earth. Habakkuk. In Habakkuk 2.14, the, the earth is filled with the knowledge of the Lord's glory as the, wa as the waters cover the seas. How will the world know if God's people don't make a joyful noise? Well, that's just, I mean, our, our, our attitude is, well, someone else will do it. Oh, I don't have time to do that. I really don't want to. I mean, if it doesn't interfere with my stuff. God's glory is to cover just as the waters cover the sea. We think, oh, that, that's impossible. But, folks, when we look in Matthew chapter 28, 
That's not wishful thinking when, God, when Jesus Christ says, go and preach the gospel to who? The whole world. This call to worship, it's global. Here's another reality. The, the spirit of worship that we see here in Psalm 100 is joyful. Make a, a joyful noise. Look at verse 2. Serve the Lord with what? Gladness. Come before his presence with what? Singing. Have any of you ever tried to sing and have a bad attitude at the same time? Does it work? No, we just don't sing. We, we sit there with a bad attitude. You can't sing and have thoughts that are contrary to God going on at the same time. See, when we sing, it is with gladness. The spirit of worship is to be joyful. We don't have to come into the Lord's house. We get to come into the Lord's house. We don't have to sing. We get to sing. We don't have to come and sit to sit and, and to hear God's word proclaimed. We get to come and hear God's word proclaimed. See, folks, that attitude, those two attitudes are totally different. But somehow, many times, we take Everything that we do with the Lord, we, we want to combine it with this attitude of I have to or God's not going to be happy with me. Listen, folks, everything that we do for the Lord ought to be we get to because of who Christ is and what Christ has done for each and every one of our lives. That's being joyful. See, Psalm 100 is for us. We are to be marked with joy. I think it's kind of funny. You ever see the movie, or the movie, the, the TV show Mythbusters? See, it, if you haven't, it, 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 they're a team of, of science whizzes who work out these crazy exper experiments. And here's the thing. Sometimes they blow things up. I mean, blowing things up, that's just kind of cool sometimes. I mean, it's kind of like as you get older, I mean, we, we don't change from not liking toys. Just guys, our toys just cost a whole lot more. You know, maybe as a kid, there was, there was the excitement of blowing up, I don't know, boxes. But the thought of, ooh, bigger and badder booms they just they just draw to our, our our inward being and so sometimes it involves blowing things up in the name of science and at the beginning of every show they say the very same thing don't try this at home leave it to the experts Here's the thing, folks. There is no label like that on Psalm 100. There is no, don't do this at home. Don't do this here. It says, make a joyful noise. We acknowledge our sin in the light of God's holiness. We realize the redemption that we have in Jesus Christ. And folks, if that does not excite you, 
there's something spiritually wrong. I don't know how we can sit the same week in and week out with this thought of, of God's redeeming love on us and it not move us. Because here's the thing, when, when the truth of the gospel gets into our bloodstream, our worship is unmistakable. I mean, think about it in Psalm 34, 19. Many are the, uh, the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivered him out of them all. See, Peter describes this joy as inexpressible and glorious in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 8. Whom having not seen, ye love. And whom thou, now ye see him not yet believing, you do what? Rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Let me ask you this morning real quick, does that describe your worship? Does that describe your worship? Or do we find ourselves with our worship? Well, if someone else did this or did that, I could worship. But listen, our worship has nothing to do with someone else or, or that person or that person. Our worship, the only person it ought to deal with and matter with is him. The reality is our spirit, our spirit of worship is to be joyful. But lastly, the scope of our worship is to be total. All. You notice the psalm doesn't say some. The psalmist doesn't say when you feel like it. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord all ye land. And in turn, serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. It's total. It covers everything. It, it covers the noise we make. It covers how we serve. Paul, in, in Colossians chapter 3, and verse 17, whatever you do in word or deed, do everything What? In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God. Everything. If our worship is tied to this building, what are we doing when we leave that building? Folks, worship is a 24 7. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 31, so whether you eat or drink or, or whatever you do, do everything for what? The glory of God. See, this life, this life that you and I live, it is meant to be an act of worship. Francis Havergal. 1874. Anybody right off the top of their head know who Francis Havergal is? Shame on you. I'm just messing with you. How about this? Does this ring a bell? Take my life and let it be. We've sung that hymn, haven't we? How many... At least know or remember times and past singing that hymn. Right off the top of your head right now, how many can remember what the words are? So when we sing it, do we sing it with truth then? Take my life, verse 1, and let it be consecrated. You know what that means, consecrated means? Set aside. Lord, to thee. Take my moments and my days, not my Sundays, not my Wednesdays, 
but take my moments and my days. Let them flow in endless praise. Verse 2, take my hands and let them move. Oh, I'm not supposed to be sitting still. At the impulse of thy love. Take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for thee. Take my voice. This is the verse. This is the, the verse that Baptist churches usually kick, kick out. We don't usually sing the third verses or even, you know, if there's multiple verses, it's usually like the third, fourth, maybe the fifth verses that we don't sing. But take my voice in verse 3 and let me sing always only for my king. Take my lips and let them be filled with the messages from thee. When was the last time you shared Jesus Christ with someone? Verse 4 of the song, take my silver and my gold, not a mite would I withhold. Take my intellect and use every power as thou shalt choose. Take my will and make it thine. It shall be no longer mine. Take my heart. It is thine alone. It shall be thy royal throne. Take my love, my Lord, I pour at thy feet its treasure store. Take myself and I will be ever only all for thee. If we were to sing that song this morning, would it actually be worship? Because it's truth? Or would it be just noise? Something we do. You see, the word serve here in verse 2, it's used in the Old Testament to describe formal acts of praise in the temple. Or, but it's, it's the same word used in Genesis chapter 2, described as, as just ordinary work that we do. Folks, worship is an all of life thing that stems from our thanks to God. See, God has blessed in, in some indescribable ways and majority of our time we can't really describe what God does worship is what we give out of thanks for who and what God has done for us we're in a season of thanksgiving is it more thanks in getting or is it thanks and giving. As the Spirit speaks to our hearts this morning, how do we truthfully answer that question? Let's pray. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you. Come, Lord, and we thank you. Lord, first of all, and foremost, we thank you for Jesus. His life that led to a cross, the blood that was shed, enabling us to be forgiven, the bondage of sin broken, the bondage of death bro being broken as he was resurrected, ascending to heaven to prepare a place for each and every one of us. Providing the Holy Spirit as he walks with us and fills us and moves us and instructs us.
Lord, we have so many things to be thankful for. As my prayer this morning, Lord, that by the strength of the Holy Spirit, Lord, we would just would say, Lord, I want to give back to you. As, a, as an individual, as a family, as a church family, Lord, I ask that you, your spirit would move in this place this morning, Lord, we would be obedient to the speaking that is done to our hearts. Lord, I ask that you accept our thanks and praise this morning. And Lord, I pray that if there's one here that has never put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, Lord, I pray there's your spirit would draw them to you, realizing what they need is a relationship with you. May you have your way, and it's in Jesus Christ's name that we pray. Amen. I'm going to ask you to please stand.